Good afternoon. We are here on Philly Jazz Blog, and today we're talking to another fiber in the fabric of jazz in Philadelphia, guitarist first, but also vocalist, Mr. Jimmy O'Dell. Hello, Jimmy. How you doing? I'm good, man. How you doing? I'm doing fine today. I am happy to be here in your home, and I want to have an opportunity to talk with you about how you got started in the music and share some of that rich musical heritage that you have with the rest of people. So, in reading your bio, I noticed that somewhere around 1950, you got a guitar and a music book and went to a room, and then what happened? Well, actually, it was 1951. Okay. It was, I had a brother who was okay. a guitar player. Okay. I didn't even know he was a guitar player. But he, he, he was in World War II. Okay. So when the Korean War broke out, he was in the reserves, Mm -hmm. And he got called up to the reserve, went up to Boston, got hooked up with some of uh, our old uh, Portuguese uh, uh, relatives. Okay. And when he came, came home, a uh, year playing. later, he's playing. He's playing <laughs> the guitar. And okay. I'm shocked and surprised, you know, because <laughs> my dad also played guitar. Okay. But he played like a Hawaiian type with the with the... The side bar, thing. He picked on his fingers and okay. he played like that. So there's some musical background in your family then. Oh yeah. Okay. I had my oldest brother also fool around with the guitar. Okay. Like now Oscar, the one who got me to play the guitar, he came home from the Korean War and he was actually playing. Okay. And I was shocked and surprised. And, and <laughs> my dad had a guitar, but he kept it in a box okay. in the corner Locked in his bedroom. And you knew better. With than a lock on it. Right. And if you got into that box, it was on pains of death. <laughs> you was in trouble. <laughs> Deep trouble. <laughs> okay. And so nobody ever touched that guitar. Okay. And when Oscar came home playing, I'm sitting listening because I always loved the sound of the guitar. Okay. My brother bought a uh, Victrola in 1943. Okay. After he got out of high, high school, he got him a little job, and he had a whole stack of Nat King Cole records. He right. played all oh. everything that Nat King Cole <laughs> did, he had. And played it. And played it. And so that was my beginning. I used uh, to have the broom standing in the corner, okay. mimicking the <laughs> guitar, because gotcha. I love the sound of Oscar Moore playing the guitar. Okay. It was just, I, I, I can hear him now. Okay. In fact, I got some old Nat King Cole that I play every day on, yeah. You have a 78 machine or oh, you have no, a tape? This, oh. I got it on uh, CD or DVD. Video on, v, on uh, CD now. Okay. It's on CD, but. You listen to it still? I listen to it. Okay. Till today. All right. So when did you get your first actual guitar since you were playing broom at well, this time? Okay. <laughs> now, when Oscar came home, I went out and started looking at guitars. Okay. I didn't see a guitar I could afford, you know. Right. It was and, very expensive at that time. Yeah, because I had a little job when I finished high school. I was 19 years old, and I had a job as a porter working in the Millard Road department store. Okay, now wait a minute. So, this was in Virginia. Because, yeah, Richmond. Yeah, people need to know that you're yeah. a really a Richmond, Virginia guy. This was in Richmond, Virginia. Okay, all right. And uh, so I finally got up enough money, bought a whole harmony guitar. Okay. I don't know. It was so it was so bad that strings sit up high and they, <laughs> my fingers turned green <laughs> and they started to bleed with blisters and all okay. that. I played all through all of that. All right. Did and you sleep with your instrument? Did you get at a point where you took it to bed with you playing? No, woke up? no, okay. it wasn't wasn't that. But uh, I spent every waking hour that I wasn't working, and finally I got so interested in the instrument I started to go on my lunch hour down to Walter D. Moses Music Store. Mm -hmm. They had all these fine Gibsons up there in the caves. And this is again and, in Virginia State. Yeah, okay. you know, so I used to sit there doing my lunch hour and they let me strum the guitar. And man, okay. I, if I ever got me some money, I would we'll buy me, me one, one of these, these boys, you know. <laughs> so I started spending too much time there. So sometimes my lunch hour turned into two hours. I'm still right. at a music store. Right. I get back to my job one day. The man said, look, don't call us. We call you. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Is that when you became a musician? That's when I became a musician. But then I got my little service pay. Okay. And I bought a better guitar. Got you. And uh, so I got, and I had an amplifier. Oh, man. So, man.
man, you know, like I was serious now. I didn't have no job. Uh, so I just went upstairs every day. My mom tell me, you got to go look for work. I go out and mimic like I'm looking for work. Right. And I'll be back in that room. <laughs> and like Strong. from about July 51 till October, I was up there being my man, Nick Monoloff music book. Okay. Learning everything I can learn about okay. the guitar. You know, right. how to read. And how, how to read music. You taught to, yourself how to read? I taught myself. Okay. And in October, there was a, a a kid who was still in Armstrong High. He's still in school, played trombone and piano. Okay. He had a band form. And a guy in my neighborhood, about three blocks up the street, was a saxophone player. Okay. So he told me one day, come on, come on, go to the band rehearsal with him. So right. I did. Right. Next thing you know, I'm playing in the band. Okay. And what's the name October, of that band? What was the name of that band? The name, that was... Um, uh, uh, it might come back. Hugh Jackson. Hugo okay. Jackson. Hugo Jackson. It was Hugo Jackson. He played right. piano and trombone. trombone. Right. We didn't use a bass. You know, a lot of bands then didn't have a bass. Right. You know, if, if anybody was unnecessary, they felt that was it. Sure. So I'm playing the chords, you know, right. and they had a saxophone player that was decent. He okay. played piano and, and a good drummer. Okay. His name was Ken Wa Kenny Washington. Okay. And I played with them until I went in the army. Okay. I went in the army in July '52. Okay. July '52. Uh, when I'm in the army, I end up in Korea. Gotcha. Korea. While in Korea, while the shooting was on, uh, I was with the signal, the 45th Division Signal Company. Gotcha. And there was no time then. To be playing no music, sure. you know? right? Yeah. But when the shooting stopped around, the war was over around August, I think, '53. Okay. And then they moved everybody back, you mm -hmm. know. And I ended up in uh, Yongdong Po, uh, which was a big city. Okay. In a big, big in a big signal depot. Okay. And like it was like a nine to five. <laughs> I was fortunate enough to meet Fats Wallace's son. Uh, uh, another guy who's a friend of mine to the day, trumpet player, Herbie Fields. Okay. He was a music enthusiast, dead on Miles Davis, love Miles. Okay. So I had guys who were fellow musicians to sit around and show me everything. That was my introduction to jazz, really. Okay, really. And these guys are playing jazz till now, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, Leon Mitchell mentioned the same thing in the Army. Yeah. The musicians in the Army band helped develop him as a musician, and he well, was saying a lot of people talk about the Army from a negative, but in his life, it was very positive because it gave him the roots of music, because he had real yeah. musicians who could read music and Absolutely. had instruments. And they, had, they formed a band right. and on, on weekends, Friday and Saturday sure. night, we in the NCO club. Right, man. jam. I'm playing, man, like <laughs> every weekend okay. uh, that, I was, that I stayed in Korea. Now, I left Korea, uh, around late May, early June of 1954. Okay. Came back to the States. When I got out of the Army, about August, who shows up at my door? Herbie Fields. Same the trumpet player Army. I was in Korea with. Right. He trying to encourage me to, to, to join back up, you know, to uh, rejoin the Army. Rejoin the uh, Army. Okay. And do, what, six years <laughs> right. and get a, get another strike. Right. I was, yeah, I was like, a staff sergeant. He gonna right. get me, make me an FFC <laughs> and uh, 45 days leave and about $2,000 in my pocket right. to re-up, you know. Right. But man, sure. I, after them two years I spent now, I mean, I, I told them right there, man, I wouldn't join nothing where everybody wore the same uniform. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't join a church choir. You know? Right, exactly. <laughs> there wasn't no parts of it. And uh, I hear you. so he he actually he he did twenty years in the army. Okay, he did the life tour. And uh, but he lived in Newark, New Jersey. Okay, that was his home. But he came to Richmond to try to get me. Yes, you know. Okay. So eventually, I moved to Newark, New Jersey, in okay. 1955, okay. August 55. I moved okay. to Newark, New Jersey. You didn't re-enlist, but you came to Jersey. No, I came to right. Jersey. Okay. Then. Uh, my best friend, who we went through elementary school and high school together, mm. he was in the Marine Corps. We hooked up in Korea, and he he said, "Well, why don't you come to Jersey, man?" Cause, you know, I wasn't. Yeah. I was playing in a band. I was still doing some stuff with Hugo Jackson, and I was playing with 
Nathan Edwards band. Nathan Edwards was a trumpet player who was the brother of uh, the singer Edwards. Her, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. His name was, uh, well. Last name Edwards? His last name was Edwards. He did Chicks Too Young to Fry. And, okay. Uh, he, was, he was pretty famous around then. He was still in New York. I ran into him one after I had been in Newark a while. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you his name in a minute. Okay. But See, Newark's Roman, close but to New York, so you were definitely in the flow oh, yeah. by that point. Oh, yeah. yeah. So after coming to, to Newark, I got married in 56. Okay. And my wife didn't want me to be a musician. Right. She wants you to have and a good job. So I was fooling <laughs> around. and wasn't in any band in Newark, but I was going everywhere. Seeing everybody who right. was playing, okay. West come to town, all these people mm -hmm. I be, they be in town Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I be there Friday, Saturday, <laughs> <Yeah. Okay. laughs> I be right there, man. Okay. And uh, eventually one day I took the rent money and bought an amplifier because a guy offered me a job in a band. Okay. It was Hal Page and the Whalers. Okay. And I stayed in his band from '57 mm -hmm. till. About 61. How'd that move with the rent money work out with the wife? Well, it blew over. Because, <laughs> see, she didn't have the business to see I was right. going to make money. Right, exactly. And I worked, I worked almost seven nights a week. Okay. Sometimes twice a day. Right, right. And so. all of the people who came to Newark, I played behind. Right. Little Anthony and the Imperials, the Isley Brothers, Bill Doggett. Okay. When Nat King Cole come to town, I was on the stage. I didn't have to play. I just right. had my instrument, right. but I got paid. Gotcha. And uh, because they had to pay so many musicians, musicians. playing in right. a union the house. Union hall. See? Right. Right. So one night I got paid three times. When Wilson Pickett came to Newark, okay. he had a small group, like five pieces, and, right. and I was there. I, and when you go in to get paid, mm -hmm. you knock on the door. You go in, the guys come in. He never looks up. Bushel baskets of money all over the floor. Right. I ain't never seen so much money in my life. <laughs> he said, we are a musician. He Pain. divvy out your money, never looked up. Keep on that money. <laughs> I went back three times, got paid for the same thing. <laughs> Don't say, this is going to be, Jimmy, this is being recorded now. They're yeah. going for you for the views. <laughs> That was, uh, Pancho <laughs> Diggs was okay. the union <laughs> rep for Local 16, the, the Musicians Union in Newark at Newark. the time. Okay. Pancho just took a liking to me. He was a guy for some reason. Definitely. So every time a group came to town where they needed more musicians, he called me. Call. And I got, I, you know, I got paid. Made out know, well so. there. And got to play with a lot of people. Yeah. Because you, I think on your resume you mentioned uh, Coltrane and other people that came through too. They came that through. Came through. There was a place in Newark called the Key Club. Okay. And I used to know the guy, his, his wife, and this guy that owned the place. When I first found out about the Key Club, they were right in a neighborhood on, I think it was West Street. Okay. Right around in a residential neighborhood. Okay. But his house was a club. Oh, okay. And uh, they had all the swinging cats would, would be playing the key club. Right. West, Train, right. Right. Uh, Hank Mobley, and a guy that played in the in the, the How Page and the Whalers band with me for a while was Eddie Wright. Mm -hmm. Great guitar player. Gotcha. Eddie was a bad joker. I mean. He was a jazz player. Okay. And him and I played in the same group. Was and that we, unusual then to have two guitarists back at well, that time? We switched off okay. playing the bass. Gotcha. The oh, bass okay. Line. Gotcha. Right. I played gotcha. bass line a while, oh, and then he, right. you know, gotcha. while he okay. solo, and he played bass line while I solo. It. Gotcha. It, it worked that way. Okay. We didn't have a, a real bass, you know. Right. I understand. And how plays played played the piano and sang. Okay. That saxophone player, and uh, uh, you weren't singing. Drummer. You weren't singing. No, at that time. I wasn't singing then. Okay. Uh, Gus Young, who used to play with Miles and all the right. people, was the drummer. Okay. And uh, Jerry Patterson, for a while, was the guitar player. Okay. When he left and went on the road with Gladys Knight, 
then Eddie Wright came in mm -hmm. and was Eddie and I. So you did a lot of R&B too, in addition Mostly to jazz. Mostly Hal Page played R&B. That's, okay. that's what he did. Right. He was an R&B player. Sure. And he worked all the time. Gotcha. Sometimes he'd be working in three places at the same time. <laughs> he'd have two bands over here and a right. band over yeah. here. And, run and then he'd run around, sing over here, sing over there. That's what ah. got him canned out of New York. <laughs> <laughs> but right. I worked with him, and I worked all the time. Okay, so it was very good, that investment you made of the mortgage oh, yeah. or the rent money. See, I worked in the dry cleaners during the day, but... The guy I worked for owned Jolly Cleaners in Belleville, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. His pro his uh, system was: you come in early, and when you finish the day's work, you go home. Mm -hmm. I was cleaning clothes, spotting, right, sure, doing exactly. all that. First, I start I started really in the laundry department, mm -hmm. and I was so good in the laundry department. When two guys quit in the dry cleaning department. He sent me to the dry cleaning department. And, and, and never didn't hide nobody. Two people. Didn't hide nobody with me. And I ran the whole department okay. by myself. Right. So you were really a dry cleaner. Yeah. You were dry yeah, cleaner. Yeah, I did that for I cleaned clothes exclusively for like thirteen years. Okay. Right. And uh, and uh, as a kid, I started working in the dry cleaners at eleven. My aunt had a had a dry cleaners oh. in Richmond. Oh, okay. So uh, I learned a lot there. I learned gotcha. how to business, operate the pressing machines and right. all that, you know. So, so I knew what was happening in dry cleaners. So you I cleaned just, during the day and jammed at night? One, one thirty every day at Jimmy B and this car gone. Okay. Only time in my life I had a brand new car. <laughs> I haven't had one since. <laughs> it happens. It 1956 happens. Chevy. 56 Power years. pack. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't bought a new car since then, I haven't bought a new car since. I know you had a car, but you, you got a dependable car. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, know, I've, uh, I've had better cars right. than that. Right, sure, mean, sure. I've, I've read since then I had, right. you just don't I buy think I new. traded that for a Lincoln, mm -hmm. and I've been driving Lincolns and Caddies ever since okay. then, you know. All right. So but, when, uh, when did you move to Philly? Okay, we got you in Virginia, uh, you moved up to Newark for some years. I lived in Newark for like seven years, then I bought a house, built a house in Roselle, New Jersey. Okay. Lived in Roselle till about 66. Okay. And then I remarried and moved to Burlington, New Jersey. Okay. Lived in Burlington, New Jersey till for a couple of years, then moved to Beverly. And I was in Beverly till 1996, and I moved to Philly. Okay. Yeah. Here? Yeah. Okay. And, uh... So... I, I was working in Philly right, most right. of the time anyway, okay. so I figured I might as well move here. So that was from when you were, like, in Beverly? You were still coming over the bridge yeah. regularly? Yeah, I was gotcha. still coming okay. over. All right. I started to play in Philly in 1969. All right. I think the first gig I had was with Mickey Collins. Mm -hmm. The drummer and singer. Oh, okay. I don't know if you know I'm Tony Collins and Billy Collins. She's a vocalist around town now. Okay. Plays with Joe Sutter's big band. Currently performing. She currently performed with Joe Sutter's big, big band. band. Her right. dad, I played in his band. Gotcha, okay. And uh, played around over in Jersey for a good while. And uh, the first job I had in Philly was with Mickey Collins. Okay. And then uh, I played with Newt Stewart for 18 years. Newt Stewart, Tommy Grace, Paul Comp, and myself. 18 years? 18 years. Okay. And, and that was all in Philly? No, well, we played rally in Philly. We played right. mostly in New Jersey. Okay, all right. And uh, when I first went with that band, I think it was about 68, 67, maybe, mm -hmm. Uh, they had a piano player. His name was Alan Bosley. Bosley. He was a, a, a little older than I was, or mm -hmm. uh, he might have been older than Luke Stewart. Mm -hmm. But he played for about a year with the band, then he died. Mm -hmm. They never got another piano player. I was the piano. Gotcha. You know? Gotcha. Which explains the way I play the guitar. Okay. I was for 18 years or so the piano. Right. And the string piano. It has, it's been good. But I run into problems when I play with pianos because they seem to think I'm in their way. Right, yeah, you're competing. And, uh, 
And of course, I, I think the real good piano players that I play with like the way I play because we have our voice together. An interchange, right. An interchange. Right. And uh, I play with Skip, mm. George, Mr. Hazy. I mean, right. these are top-notch cats, right. uh, you know. Right. And, and we really have it going on. Okay. But some guys uh, kind of like it their way and right. they don't want interference of mm -hmm. any kind, you know. And You upset uh, their balance. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you know, it's like I'm invading their territory. Gotcha. And organ players, I kind of had the same problem with because mm -hmm. they just want you to go chunk, 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 you know. Right, right. And uh, <laughs> that's kind of difficult when you've got a voice and so much to other. be heard and right. so much stuff. Right. Frankly, I think organs are very limited. Uh, they're a limited instrument. They can only do one way, you gotcha. know. But okay. the guitar can go so many different ways, you I know. know. It speaks. And uh, but it, it's all been good, okay. you know, and it's all been like a learning experience mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, I know uh, that you said um, in fifty years you're still learning how to play a guitar. Absolutely. Right. Right. I mean, if I mean, if if I go a day without practicing, I know it. Mm -hmm. If I go two or three days without practicing, everybody knows. <laughs> I'm serious. Okay. You also play piano too? I see a piano here. No, my right. wife plays okay. the piano. Right. You know. I just wanted sometimes yeah, people yeah. are most like like Craig. I walk nah. into Craig's house, he's got all these vibes. <laughs> I thought it was somebody else in the house. He said it's only me. But so I thought maybe you did that too. My wife raised up playing the piano. Okay, but I know a lot of musicians do go into piano because when you go into composing and things of that nature, they say it's good to know that. No, I never, I, I bought a piano one time hoping to learn, but it made my arms so sore that it was difficult for me to play right. the guitar. Okay. So, so I cut it loose. Gotcha. But recently I bought me an alto saxophone. I've always wanted to learn how to play. <laughs> I'm determined that I'm going to play that thing. Gotcha. Right now, right. my granddaughter has it because okay. she's taking Lesson. uh, lessons right. in, in her school. She's mm -hmm. like in the fifth grade, I think. Okay. And she's playing in the school band. All right. So I, I let her have let it. Let her have it. Right. Because when you learn dear hard, you got to teach your pop up. <laughs> right, right, exactly. All you really got to do is lock yourself in a room. Yeah. You know, hey, lock yourself in a room with that horn, you'd be a saxophone. Uh, I, don't know, but, I don't know if that's going to work. <laughs> but I, I'm determined that I'm going to play it. Okay, I'm going to play it. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Let me, one of the other things I try to do when I'm talking to people, especially from Philadelphia, since Philadelphia has such a reputation for being a jazz mecca, and there were people here in various stages of the evolution of where we are, I want to get your impression of what the state of jazz in Philadelphia today is. There are people who might say that, in some cases, technology is watering the music down. You know, some people said electric did it when they started electrifying everything. <laughs> you know, uh, some people say Philly's a great place to work, and I love being here. Other people say you got to leave town in order to be successful. Okay, so what's your opinion about the state of jazz in Philadelphia as of today, July twenty sixth, two thousand six? <laughs> this ain't saying it's always going to be this way or it always was, but how is it today for Jimmy O'Dell? Well, you're kind of asking uh, probably the wrong guy. Okay. And here's the reason. When I arrived in Newark in the early 50s, Newark was the mecca gotcha. of jazz okay. and music. And that was my experience. Mm -hmm. That was music all over Newark. Everywhere. Everybody came to Newark. That's where I met all of these big right. name people. Right. That's how I, I, I would personally introduce myself. Kenny Burrell, Wes Montgomery, mm -hmm. Jimmy McClinton, mm -hmm. uh, you name it. All the guitar players who came to town usually stayed at one of the hotels. I think you said the Douglas. Jimmy, uh, Was it the Douglas Hotel? At the Douglas Hotel, that's where a lot of them stayed. Right. Yeah, yeah I remember and that. And like, piece. I'd be at the Douglas Hotel early in the morning with sandwiches and coffee. Sometimes it would be me and, and uh, uh, a drummer, uh -huh. and sometimes it would be me and another guitar player. Right. Uh, you bring food. Huh? You brought food. Yeah, we brought food and coffee, man. Okay. And uh, we knock on the door, and these guys, I only had one person to be this courteous. Okay. And he was a saxophone player, but I thought he was a fantastic player. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
by and large, everybody was nice. Come on in, sit you down, man. God be so happy that, they, they, that somebody recognized their wealth, their mm -hmm. worth. Right. And uh, you know, we were young, so they show you stuff. Right. You know? Right. One guy was discourteous to me. His name was King Curtis. Mm -hmm. Never will forget it. I read the paper. Boom. Guy's dead. Somebody was stabbing at that. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I thought he was a fantastic horn player. Right, right. But he and just didn't want any of your sandwich or give you no time. No, yeah, you know, <laughs> you, you know why y'all wake me up? Get out of here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, but so but you were able to pick up a lot of your skills when you were young, talking to people and learning musicians' yeah. trade from well, these people. Well, if you come away from a guy and you learn two or three changes or, mm -hmm. uh, or why they do things a right. certain way sure. and how they did it. Right. Uh, I mean, that was a wealth. That, that was, was a wealth. You, you yeah. got away with something, man. That's more than money. You know what I mean? It's more than money. I mean, I have a very good friend here in Philadelphia. Uh, I've been knowing him since he came back to Philadelphia. He, he was, uh, lived here in Philly before he went out on the road as okay. a youngster. Okay. Came back and uh, he, he didn't know what was going on in the city, you know? Mm -hmm. So I. Took him around, introduced him, told him all the places to go. Now, Jimmy Bruno, he, okay. to me, he's one of the technically the finest guitarists maybe on this planet. Okay. But I go to listen to him, and I, I can't come away with a thing. <laughs> because he's, he, just when you think you got something, he got 50 things more. I mean, he is the most fantastic. fantastic. Okay. Uh, uh, Two hands you ever saw holding a guitar. I mean, and the guy can play, man. Right. I mean, he's just he's just a monster. And some of the stuff he's doing, you can't even pick up? I can't pick it up. You know, I, that that's stuff, saying, so. I mean, it's just it's just so much, man. You know, it's, you're just inundated with stuff, you know. Well, there's a and, plug uh, for Mr. Bruno. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the guy is, I mean, ooh, man, he's just a monster. Okay. Man. Well, and, everybody uh, has somebody they look up to, and you know, Although I didn't ask you that, you're, you're saying this gentleman, Mr. Bruno, was one, but maybe when you were younger, who else did you listen to besides Nat King? Oh, I had, well, Oscar Moore. Okay. There were three guitar players in Richmond when I first became interested in the instrument. Okay. One was uh, George Turrell. Mm -hmm. He was a good guitar player. Right. Willing, he would help you, but he didn't have a lot of time. Okay. Another one was Chester Saunders. He stayed on the road. Chester Saunders was probably one of the best guitar players I ever knew. Okay. But he he stayed out on the road a lot. You know, you might catch him once or twice a year. You know, mm -hmm. when he was in Richmond. Right. Oh, okay. And the other guy was Salvador. Mm -hmm. I don't even know his real name. Okay. I, I know he he probably borrowed Salvador from somewhere. That's one but of one name was, people. Yeah, <laughs> but he came to Richmond, though back to Richmond, and he, I don't know if you're familiar with Sal Salvador. I know, I wasn't. He, was, he played with Stan Kenton. Okay, Stan Kenton. And that's where he was. Okay. I mean, he did all of that stuff. He so had those three people technique. were kind of the influences from the Virginia end. Yeah, right. yeah. But I don't want to diverge back to Virginia because we already came through there. We're in Philly now, and I'm trying to still capture your impression of the state of jazz of Philadelphia, in spite of it okay. no longer being the mecca it was, or maybe you feel that it is again. Maybe we have some new young talent coming through. Oh, there's a wealth of talent coming okay. to Philadelphia. Uh, it seems to be an endless uh, wealth of talent. All right. uh, I guess about maybe 15 or 20 years ago, I met Tony Williams. And Tony had a youth group called Encore. Okay. And let me tell you, the bass player in that group now is one of the finest in the world. He's playing all, all over. Uh, his name Clark? was Dal Hall. Oh, Dal Hall, right. You know? Right, yeah. Darryl, okay. Right. Joey D. Francesco was right. a piano player. Mr. Down B. Yeah. Organ player. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. And uh, he had a drummer. I don't know if he's still playing, but. Uh, some of those guys are still around, still playing. Mark Johnson is playing. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So it was Tony's a good son was playing alto horn. Okay. I thought he was very good, uh -huh. and he's still playing. Uh, right. Every now and then you meet some phenomenon, young guy. You right. know, you you know, 
I was down in South Philly a few years ago jamming and I ran into this kid. And I was amazed, alto player. Now he's out on the road making that big money and playing. His name is Jaleel. Jaleel Shaw. You know him? Right. You know yeah. what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a Clef Club product too. Yeah. Yeah, he came out of Clef Club. And uh, I mean, they, they mm -hmm. just, I don't know, it must be something in the water. You know, they, you know, <laughs> they show punch, up, man. Schuylkill Punch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Musically speaking. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, I wonder how guys 14, that's some piano player around here now. Yeah. Just come through, got his own CD out, man. Right. He's just a monster, you know. Exactly. Where did he get it from? I know? listened to a 13-year-old the other day who's going to put out a, a DVD, and he's a tenor saxophonist. Yeah. Right. So the talent is here. But is the environment of Philadelphia a fertile place in terms of the state of jazz. So I think I heard you, if I'm paraphrasing you, saying that there's still a wealth of talent. Uh, what about venues and places to play? What do, what, do you, what do you think about that? How's the state of Philadelphia jazz right now in that regard? Venues come and go. Okay. I guess venues have always <coughs> come, come and go. Right. You know? uh, and I, I guess the more things change, the more they remain the same. Okay. Most of the older musicians like myself would probably tell you that back in the day, right. it was always the guys that couldn't play got all the gigs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there are guys today who their whole life is uh, get on the horn, get on the computer, right. do whatever you do to get gigs, and that's your job, finding jobs. Right. Uh, that's uh, the way a lot of musicians operate. Personally, that's the side of the business I detest. Okay. I hate having to market yourself. Market so to myself. Speak. Go right. and explain to somebody who know good and well what I right. do. Right. Why did I do it here? You right. know. Exactly. You know what I mean? Right. right. Uh, my wife, we argue about this all the time because <laughs> to me, my, I think my time could be better spent at home honing my craft. Then out beating then the out street. beating the bushes trying right. to get a job, right. and then after you get it, you it's too late to horn. Right, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? and, and there's also uh, jazz politics. Right. Uh, as as a as, as just a person who listens and not being involved in the business in that regard, as I started getting closer to some people and personalities in the jazz business, I would hear certain things and I was like, man, there's some infighting in here. Oh, See, there, are, there are cliques Politics. and all of that in the business and sometimes if you're outside of that circle, you don't get to work at this venue, oh, yeah. et cetera. Absolutely. Right. Now, I don't say that that maybe isn't happening in other cities like, for instance, New York. I mean, we compare ourselves to New York all the time, but I imagine somewhere in New York too, you gotta be, you gotta know somebody, yeah. whether it's another musician or otherwise. I mean, you gotta, yeah, know the right hand to shake. You know, yeah, the right hand to shake. But right. you know, you were reading in my bio uh, where that expression about uh, my being the best kept secret in Philadelphia. Exactly right. Well, to me, what it means is this: I recognize the fact that. When the big things come, like, like we just right West Oak Lane, West or, o, like right. cousin Mary's cousin Mary's thing City. last right. Sunday, right? Umpteen musicians were there, right? You see everybody's name on the brochure, but mine. Uh, but here's another thing: you don't see any other male vocalists on there. Yeah, you know, right. I mean, they treat male vocalists yeah. like they got the play. Right. Yeah, but you they gotta got to be a diva. They got all the divas on there. You know what I mean? Got 15 of them. At least got three too many. Yeah. You know, look, I don't have anything against female vocals. Right. In fact, I love them. Right. And and I think that every band ought to have a, 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 a vocalist. female vocalist. Female or but, just a vocalist? Well, fem you know, you have to use what sells. You know? Gotcha. Right. So and, female vocalists. And sells female more. vocalists do sell. Right. I mean, sometimes, you know, there may be six or eight male vocalists right. that make you forget them, right. but they still sell. Right, exactly. Okay. <laughs> you know, and uh, my gripe is this, if I may be allowed to have a gripe. On this Sometimes, tape, every now and then, you ought to at least have Jimmy. 
I, I so. don't think I'm so shabby that I can't hold my own. Right. You favor everybody. You, know? you favor them all, and on an individual basis, because you know people talk. You ask somebody <laughs> who is when you think of guitar in Philadelphia, and almost every single time your name is first. Is that they right? say Jimmy O'Dell. So yeah. you look when somebody play guitar, Jimmy O'Dell, Manette Sutherland. Yeah. Jimmy O'Dell, Manette Sutherland. Yeah. I don't even. <laughs> We can't even think of who the second person is on guitar. Uh, 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 I know who. Uh, well, there are there uh, other guys. Uh, uh, yeah, there are other some guys. Fine, that, believe me, there are some fine. In fact, one guy to me, I think he may be probably the nicest guitarist to listen to mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, Rob Budessa. Rob Budessa. Rob Budessa. Okay. I mean, without a doubt. Okay. I mean, I just love the way he plays. Okay. And and he's such a gentleman, man. Right. Like you know what I mean? Right. He's just a fantastic cat, man. Right. He works with his brother a lot. I was gonna say they he's a rich are musical a family. great group. Man. Great group, yeah. They are a great right. group. Yeah, I saw him with and Denise I, King recently. Yeah. Down at IKEA. Yeah. You know, Denise yeah. does IKEA. Right. Right. So that's a venue I didn't even know about. Home Improvement Center okay. jazz shows. Right. You know? <laughs> uh, they are. Uh, uh, I, I know personally two or three very good guitar okay. players around right. no. uh, that are working around Philly, but you know they don't toot that horn. Right, and all, right. You know, they, exactly. They're not marketing they're, they're either. Kinda like, they're kind of like myself. Uh, mm. I, for one, uh, for one thing, I'm almost seventy-five years old. Get out so of here, I've, Jim. I've been playing for fifty-five years. And I don't particularly want to be some big name group right. guy traveling all right. over the world here and there. You pass I, one I, to I, be a rock star? Forget that. <laughs> no, I, I like to work maybe two or three nights a week. Okay. You know? All right. I, 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 I'm not you, you're, not, you're right. And I yeah. usually find work where I find it. Uh, I work a lot out on the main line. Right. Okay. And I work in places where uh, they they would like to try music, right. so we're going to try, try you for exactly. one right. day and see how it works, mm -hmm. and, and I'm there months, years right. later, yeah. and that's kind of the way it's been, okay. and, and, and I'm happy with that. Okay. Now, okay. I don't particularly want the pressure of... A house gig. You know, yeah, some, yeah. some you know, when, when they had the stuff downtown, I, you know, it, I'm not... I'm not upset because they don't have me okay. there. I'd have to come home and shed. I agonize over a right, big right, job. Right, you know, because I want it to be nice <laughs> right. and I really want to make a good showing. Sure. But I don't want the pressure of that on me all the time. Okay. You right. know, I, right. I like it to have fun. Right. Right. You know? Well, everybody else I've interviewed, I've given them an opportunity because this video is going to be played on the internet and people around the world are going to see this. So if some of those people wanted to hear some Jimmy O'Dell music, how would you tell them how they could get access to it? Do you have a CD? I have four CDs that are in the stores right now. Okay. Are they available at CD Baby or any other uh, of those have, places? Uh, uh, Tower Records. Tower Records. I've got some right here in Chestnut Hill at the Hideaway and at okay. Intermission. Okay. They had Intermission down in uh, downtown at the uh, Kimmel Center. Okay. All right. Well, what I was uh, asking for is because if somebody in London saw right. this video and said, you know, I saw an amazing video on, on Philly Jazz blog and, and this guy sounded like he's a real interesting musician, I want to get his CD to hear what he does. Right. What, what do they do? Take my phone number, give me a call, give me your address, I'll mail it to you, you mail me right. a check. That number is 215-248-1098. Okay. And all you fine mamas, don't call after midnight. Right, right, okay. All right, cool. <laughs> there you go. That's how you can my get some My wife will put up with none of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you can get to hear Mr. Jimmy O'Dell's music, and please support him by making that phone call and if it's local people and you hear Jimmy O'Dell's going to be someplace please go out and, and support the music. By the way one other question I normally ask Jimmy is of the places you've played in Philadelphia do you have a favorite place? Is there a, a show or a time that you remember at a special club in Philly that is of paramount importance or made impact on you? 
Can you tell me anything? Uh, I played at some time, at some point, most of the places I played. But right. I guess my favorite place right now is La Rose Jazz Club. Okay, very good. Uh, I feel right. real comfortable there. It's a very, very, very comfortable place. I think they have a fine program of music with Tony Williams and Vernon Edwards in there. Somehow or another, they still have to solve how to get people to come to Germantown Avenue on a regular basis. <laughs> and you know the other thing I heard, and, and being just 55 myself, so I was born in 51 when you first locked yourself in the room. <laughs> <You're kidding>. uh, <laughs> and my father was in the Korean conflict too. But in either case, what I was about to say is, is that I've heard people say, because I sent somebody to La Rose. Somebody was okay. coming from out of town, said, where do I go, Lorenzo? I know you in the jazz, where do I go? I said, go to La Rose. It ain't far from my house, but I wasn't here and I didn't join him. When the guy got back to Chicago, he said, Lorenzo, I really enjoyed the music, man. The band was good. He said, man, but there were some old people in there. <laughs> <laughs> I said, these are the, the hanger-ons of the jazz of the last era the audience and the musicians who still come there. And so you know you're going to hear quality music. Yeah. And one of the things I share with somebody is, you know, you can get up there and play with Tony Williams, but you can't be up there practicing because Tony will tell you in a minute, practice at home. Don't come here and sit in and try to practice. And you never know who you're going to see at La Rose yeah. because I've seen you get up at La Rose, but I've seen the wide range of vocal singers get up. I was sitting at a bar at the bar one day with somebody who, you know, you never can tell the judge book by the cover. And at one point he got up and left his drink beside me and went up and he belted out some vocals that blew me away and then came back and sat down right beside me and just started drinking again. And I was like, wow. You know, so you never know. And especially on Monday nights, it's a great place because people come up and they jam and it's a nice environment. So yes, I'm plugging LaRose too and Dr. LaRose needs to keep it up and we need to support it. But maybe back in the day, back when you first came to Philadelphia, was there any place that you wanted to play that you finally got to play at? Did you play Peps? Did you play Showboat? I'm just asking just yeah. in terms of general information. No, when I, play when, I, when, I, when I arrived in Philly, Showboat and Peps were all with history. Okay, all right, uh, all right. I played uh, Zanzibar Blue, both okay. down on 11th Street, okay. and the original uh, where they are now, right. I played right. Ord Leaves. Okay, Ord Leaves is all awesome. uh, what about Geno's Empty Foxhole or the yeah. Aqua Lounge? Did you play at the Aqua Lounge out West Philly? No? Aqua Lounge, I'm trying to think, did I play the Aqua? Uh, I think I did. Okay. Uh, All right. Yeah, I All think right. I did. Okay. But uh, I played uh, so Zanzibar. 40th and Market. Uh, uh, Natalie. I played 56th and yeah. Market. Okay. Uh, I played at some point most of the venues in Philadelphia. Yeah, because you played with yeah, almost everybody. Uh, uh, Ogon's Grill, I've done that two or three yeah. times. Yeah, that's another uh, up and coming place that I think people ought to support too, the Ogon's Grill. So if people are watching this video and you're on your way to Philadelphia or coming in the next couple of months, make sure you check out the Ogon's Grill or La Rose Jazz Club and you'll do yourself a service and hear some of the best music Philadelphia has to offer and hopefully maybe even Jimmy O'Dell will be there that day so you get to hear Jimmy too. I, uh, I played the Cape May Jazz Festival for about nine years. Okay, another great venue. Uh, I haven't played the East Coast Festival yet, but I was looking through Jazz Times, the magazine okay, sure. Jazz Times, and I didn't know there was so many jazz festivals in the world. I mean, it just blow your mind. It blows your mind. And uh, there's one in my hometown, Richmond. So you got August the twelfth and thirteenth, and I'm <laughs> I'm thinking seriously, I might run out of Richmond for right. You know, now I called you, them already. Oh, you did. So you I do did. do some marketing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, Jimmy, that would be worth a call to let them know that you're from there yeah. and you want to come back. They should. Well, the mayor of Richmond, who at one point was the governor of Virginia, okay. Doug Wilder, him and I grew oh. up together. Oh, okay. You know, we 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 came up. You know, right, through right. I remember why he was the first black governor of yeah, Virginia, right? Yeah, well, he and I are very good friends. Okay. And I uh, called him and see if it was possible for him to set me up with some venue in right. Richmond. Sure. You know, he says, oh, man, come on down. The city is wide open, you know. Right. 
<laughs> so he wrote me a letter about two weeks ago okay. telling me that uh, he thinks it's possible to hook okay. me up with something. All right. so cool. We'll see. We'll uh, see. Uh, and, and it'll be Jimmy Comes Home. Yeah. yeah. Jimmy Comes <laughs> Home to Richmond. There you go. Jimmy Come Marching Home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, look, Jimmy, I certainly appreciate the time that you've spent sharing your good, rich musical heritage with us. Certainly in the future, I want to leave the door open for us to rejoin and have another conversation about you and what you're doing at that point. But thank you for your time and sharing with us. And as soon as I upload this, I'm sure our audience is going to be calling that number, but just don't call after 12. And if you do, make sure your husband calls and not the wife, so that Mr. Odell still will be up here in this fine place that he stays in. Thank you again, Jimmy. Thank you.